Hi, I am Stefan Ramkisun, attorney at law. And I'm Kyle Taklalsing, attorney at law. We would like to invite you to our new program, Section 1, airing right here on Radio and TV Jagrity from 5 to 7 p.m. on Sundays. We would like to have a discussion with you on our sovereign democratic state and issues affecting our democracy. See you there. Station TV Jagriti. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome uh, back to Section 1. As you can see, um, for the time being, it's me alone, Mr. Taklal Singh, here with you. Um, Stefan is on his way, um, and I think he should be here very shortly so that we'll start the program um, when he is on. Um, so we have a number of topics that I think are worthy of talking about um, today. A lot happening in law, a lot happening in the rule of law, a lot happening in our sovereign democratic state. We had uh, a couple weeks ago, or uh, about two weeks ago, we had the issue with OAS um, and the arbitration issue, which really hit the public waves. Essentially, the government losing uh, a case in a court of arbitration in London, whereby we have to now pay to OAS, the contractor, that contractor who was building the highway in South, um, close to $1 billion, um, you know, 100, 100 and something million US, almost 800 and something million TT dollars because of a lost arbitration um, case. And really, when you look at it, um, when you look at what happened, it seemed to me that the government was trying to spin and put their own flavor and spin, as often governments do. That's part of their prerogative on the narrative about the OAS issue. Um, so we're going to talk about that. I, there's a little video that we did respect to that that really breaks down the issue. We have the issue of the Attorney General, Mr. Reginald Amour, that is really heating up the airwaves um, today. An issue where um, Mr. Amor is accused of, how to put it, not being as forthright as he should have. Well, he's been accused plainly by the opposition leader of lying um, and misrepresenting certain facts um, to a court in the United States. Time will tell to see if that is true. And we await, and Mr. Amor, Amor has said, of course, that he has no comment on the issue, but I'm sure time will come out. Um, time, will, time will allow facts to come out, and if he has a defense, he'll put it in the public domain. I, I don't have, have any finding per se, but there are some issues there that we need to discuss because there are some issues in the public domain there that I think are worth ventilating, definitely. This is a sovereign democratic state, and in a sovereign democratic state, we have our freedom of speech, and we need to hold our um, public officials to account. Of course, you know, um, and just to say, I, I know that um, we have been off air for, I think, about two or three weeks. Of course, you had the Indian arrival there weekend, and then... We have now returned under very somber and sad circumstances where Mr. Lokesh, who I think everybody knows, um, part of the Jagrati team, um, unfortunately passed away. And we really like to give condolences to the, um, to the family and to everyone um, who knew Lokesh. You know, we miss him here a lot. He was someone who was instrumental in our, sh in our own show, giving us our own advice um, on how to conduct our show. And I know that when Stefan comes, he would also have his own um, you know, condolences to offer in that regard. Um, we have the OAS video, I think, ready. So what we'll do is now play that. Um, it's a short video. I already took the time to go through the OAS issue and explain to everybody what happened with that OAS arbitration and why I say I think that the, the government was wrong. You see, what happened is when it happened, the Prime Minister ran to Parliament to give a statement on it. And what he essentially tried to do was to blame the, the opposition um, for the loss, but really the decision which led to the loss in the arbitration, award and judgment, and the poor decision which has been um, found to be wanting by a court of arbitration is a decision that took place under the PNM regime. And, you know, I am not one here to come and defend everything that the United National Congress may have done with that, with that contract or that particular project. That's not the issue. 
you are in government, you were in government when the decision was taken, and therefore you have to take responsibility for the decision. And that's what I try to get out of the facts. So maybe what we'll do is we'll run that video, take a look at it. I think Stefan is here late, unfortunately late, um, but he is here and he will, um, and so when we come back, we'll come back with Stefan. So we want to get into this OAS arbitration issue, and it is my respectful view that the government and the head of the government, the Prime Minister, is not being transparent and forthright with the population on this issue. The first issue I have is the way in which the Prime Minister and the government decided to bring this matter to the attention of Parliament. They chose to do so by uh, what we call um, statements to the Parliament, or ministerial statements for the, to the Parliament. That has to be wrong. What that is, is essentially the Prime Minister going and speaking at the Parliament. Not subject to debate, not subject to scrutiny, no one in the opposition could question what the Prime Minister says or engage him in a debate. So essentially we just have to take the Prime Minister's word as to what are the facts of the matter. That can't be correct process and that cannot be proper parliamentary scrutiny and it defeats the constitutional purpose of Parliament. The second issue with that is that the Prime Minister went to the Parliament, spoke about the arbitration process, spoke about the arbitration award and decision, yet did not lay the entire decision before the Parliament. He could have done so. Now you might want to say, as Nidco has said, that the arbitration is confidential and we ought not to speak about it because of confidentiality provisions. Well, if that's the case, then quite frankly, the Prime Minister ought not to have said anything on the issue. But what you cannot do, and what seems to be very dangerous, especially to a democratic society, is to come and give half of the picture and half of the judgment and ruling not even half, an excerpt or two which was selected by you, probably to suit your own narrative, to the parliament and then try to spin or make your own pronouncements on what took place. That cannot be right. If you're going to speak on a topic, lay the entire procedure before parliament, lay the entire arbitration award or judgment before parliament and let citizens access it and decide who is correct and who is wrong so that the entire procedure was bad. But let's get into the OAS issue. Let's get into the arbitration. What seems to have happened, and from my view of what the Prime Minister said in Parliament yesterday, is that the government is conflating or mixing up issues. There are two issues which arise from this. One is that OAS became bankrupt and that the contract was amended under the People's Partnership, um, People's Partnership government. And the second issue is that the contract was terminated which took place in 2016 under the PNM administration. The arbitration award and the huge award made against the people of Trinidad and Tobago that taxpayers have to now fork out over $100 million to pay to OAS is as a result of the decision by the PNM government in 2016 to terminate the contract. It has nothing to do with the amendment of the contract which took place in 2015 and therefore all of this talk and narrative that the Prime Minister is now talking about about liquidation and the amending of the contract has absolutely nothing in my respectful view to do with this award by OAS this award in favor of OAS by the arbitrators which has now caused the taxpayers to find a hundreds of million a hundred million dollars which we probably don't have to pay back to OAS that is simply bad management and bad decision making by the current administration in my respectful view and the problem of course is as I've said we don't have the, 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 the report we don't have the judgment in hand but what we do have is an express report where the authors say that they have had sight of it and what the express re report says and I invite everybody to look at it it's clear firstly OA, um, OAS and NITCO got into a conflict. NITCO decided under the PNM administration's guidance to terminate the contract not because NITCO was bankrupt but because they were alleging that OAS had abandoned the contract. What does abandon mean? NITCO was alleging that OAS didn't want to do the work anymore. OAS countered that allegation in the arbitration by saying we want to do the work, it's just that you are not paying us the money to continue to do the work. That is the issue that went before the arbitrators and the arbitrators decided essentially that NITCO was wrong and they terminated the contract improperly. 
the, the, the arbitrators decided that NITCO had no grounds to terminate the contract um, for, for, a job, for abandonment and that has to be wrong and essentially that is the issue and in my view what is happening here is that the government and the Prime Minister seems to be spinning a narrative or saying something that is not what happened in the arbitration. Time will tell and the only time we will know this is when the actual full judgment of the arbitrator reaches to the public domain. Hi, welcome to Sexual One. So sorry I'm late. Abracadabra and uh, Stefan is here. Yeah. Um, but we, 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 I want Cal to take this, um, mm -hmm. this opportunity to explain the OS and see how that video out and then we could get to other topics. Other topics yeah. So, yeah. I mean, as I said in the video, what's, what is, um, first of all, it's a very, very important issue that we all need to understand. This is a situation where a decision by the executive, by government, by NITCO, which is a government um, statutory body, is going to cost taxpayers $800 million, Stefan. $800 million, we could do a lot with that in this yeah. country, especially now. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot, a lot, especially with local government elections coming up, a lot of roads, a lot of infrastructure, laptops, um, student education, so much things can be done with $800 million. So we really have to hold the government account when it takes decisions that leads to such massive losses yeah. of, of our patrimony, of our resources. They cannot, and, and the reason I wanted to make this video is because I felt that the parliament was being misused to some extent respectfully by the prime minister. He went into parliament and he started to give a statement explaining this OAS issue or purporting to explain this OAS, OAS issue by talking about um, whether or not the UNC amended the contract in 2015 and what that caused. Yes, we understand you have a gripe. That because OAS may or was going into liquidation and winding up an administration, that, that, that the UNC amended the contract to allow them to continue. But these things happen in construction. What did you want to happen? That the contract simply be abandoned? That's not the way you do business. That's not the way you do business. Especially for such a big project. And what, exactly. And what took place is that in 2016, OAS was saying that we are doing the work, we continue to yeah. perform the work, Pay us for the work that is being done. Mm -hmm. You countered that or your, your reason for terminating the contract was that um, work had stopped. It had nothing to do with amending clauses in 2015. Your mm -hmm. reason for terminating was that according to you, work had stopped um, and that it wasn't being done and there was delay, right? And therefore you don't want to pay. And it went to court and the court found that you were wrong. And that decision to terminate the contract I don't know why you wanted to terminate the contract. Is it that you wanted to terminate the contract for someone else to get the contract? Is it that you felt you had more confidence or preference to another contractor? I don't know. I'm not going to assume. But what I'm saying is whatever reason you had, well, certainly the reason you put for the termination was found wanting by a court of arbitration. Mm -hmm. And whatever your reason you had, you now have to come clean with the country and say why you terminated that contract and say why we as citizens, taxpayers, and our children and children's children would have to be footing that bill for your bad decision. And that is the point we need to drive on. Yeah. So and I think um, anyone who didn't say, I mean, I don't think we need to add anything more to this OAS issue. I think Kyle has <coughs> dealt with it quite well in terms of the video that, that, that we did. And we um, <coughs> and our, our production manager has cut up very well. What I think, um, I want to remind anyone who, who has not seen that video, that it's on all our social media platforms. Facebook, Facebook Twitter, Instagram. Instagram, so on. Any, we any, have, any um, we have a social... Account? I think we yeah, we do have a Twitter account. Okay, we, I didn't know that. Yeah, they have they have everything. <laughs> right? I know, I know and, um, you have a TikTok. I, I wouldn't know what TikTok is. Yeah. You have a TikTok. Yeah, account. no one believes that. <laughs> and um so what well, we're on all the social media platforms. So what you can do is if you miss even this show or you miss the um miss that video, which I think is very important, go look at it. Mm -hmm. Go look at it on any of our social media um platforms and and let us know what you think. Leave yeah. a comment, let us know because it's your comments that, that really fuel the show see see where we go from here so what we can do um i know kyle i came i came when you now came on and i'm and i heard you talking about um mr maraj lokesh mm -hmm. i mean I, I i could have left it for the end of the show but i think i'll be doing a disservice yeah um it's the first time on since um since lokesh unfortunately passed Personally. away yeah. and it's something i mean that one really touched me because not only was he young i mean he was our age yeah um more your age but um but he, he, was, he was our age and um, a very young person. And Lokesh was instrumental, along with Vijay, in having this show come on 
Yeah. When we when we approached, um, we didn't just approach Vachai, we approached Lokesh as the CEO. Yeah. With the idea and Lokesh loved the idea. Gave us some and, um, concepts, gave yeah, us some good ideas. He gave ideas. us the concepts. He um mm. I remember he said sitting down, Josh was there, Josh and Bimal and um and he said, and he said, hey, help these boys design a set. We come up with yeah, yeah, the yeah, privy yeah, council yeah. background. He looked at, I remember him looking uh, at the shows and sending me little WhatsApps yeah. and saying, you know, I think you all could do this and that. And yeah. he really, you know, so gradually he was, improved. Yeah. He was somebody who, um, I mean, of course, he had his hands on everything as a CEO. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on, um, hard worker. And, and, very yeah, hard, hard worker. worker at Radio and TV Jagrity. But especially at Section 1, I mean, it, 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 we needed a little break too from it because it was something different. Mm. Now walking past Lokesh office and knowing, yeah, yeah, knowing that okay. he's no longer with us. I mean, it was tough even walking in just now. I had to stop and pause. So it's a tough thing. Um, of course, condolences goes out to his family, his um. His young child, yeah. um, his wife, Vijay, um, everyone, and all of the employees here at Radio and TV Jagrity. So um, I wanted to say that before we move on because Lokesh was, as I said, very instrumental in getting Section 1 off the ground. Yeah. The amount of work we had to do, um, Josh would know this, uh, the amount of work we had to do to get off the ground. I remember Lokesh saying, um, so <laughs> Lokesh and Josh saying, that's the best background they can get, but what's that? Yeah, yeah. They didn't. They, they didn't actually know that was the privy council behind it. Was that wooden door behind there, boy? And two of them, and two of them laugh at me and Kyle for a while until we had to explain the, the reasoning behind what we what we have behind us yeah, there. So, um, again, condolences to, um, to Lukish's family and um, and everyone here who I know he was very close with it really on TV Jagrity. C- certainly on part of section one, we would miss him a lot. Yeah, we would miss him a lot. And um, so uh, we will try to um, to move on, keep section one going. The show must go. The on. show must go on. So what I will do is um. Let's take a break, Josh, and come back. We're gonna talk full. We will try to have a full discussion now about this topic with um with Senior Council Roger Modi, Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago. Ram, you are invited to join His Holiness, the Dharmacharya of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Pandit Dr. Ram Pasad Paris Ram, every Wednesday from 12.30 to 1 p.m. on radio and TV Jagriti for the program Understanding Dharma, helping us lift ourselves from the mundane to the sublime, from turmoil to peace, from bondage to salvation. Understanding Dharma with our Dharmacharya, His Holiness, Pandit Dr. Dr. Ram Pasad Paris Ram every Wednesday from 12.30 to 1 p.m. on radio and TV Jagruti. Sitaram. Sitaram, as we at Radio and TV Jagruti continue to emphasize the importance of creating healthy and happy families, it's our pleasure to present to you the program Hamare Sukhi Parivar, Our Happy Family, every Monday from 12.15 to 1 p.m. with our Dharmacharya of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, His Holiness Pandit Dr. Rampasad Paris Ram. Pandit Dr. Rampasad Paris Ram is an experienced psychiatrist and former chief medical officer who has had a long history in the line of social work. Join with him as he shares and discusses issues and ideas on improving and enhancing family life every Monday from 12.15 to 1 p.m. live on the Jagriti Network. Sitaram. <laughs> Where would I go if the world had no limits? If I could defy all boundaries? If I could ride the wind? 
where would it take me? If all roads were open to me, where would I go? If I could fly, if I were free, Join me, Harold Nabri, every Saturday afternoon from 4 for the program Suhana Safar right here on your favorite station, TV Jaguti. Suhana Safar, a program that goes behind the scenes, relives the pleasant memories and enjoy the modern music. I will explore the various aspects of the Indian film industry and celebrate with the players of this vast industry. You will hear some gazelles, bhajans, semi-classical music, and we'll also look at the history and development of the Indian music world. That's Suhana Safar every Saturday from 4 p.m. right here on your favorite station, TV Jaguti. Yes, welcome back to this section one. Um, so we have we want to talk about this issue with our honourable attorney yeah, general. There's a, and there's of course another video, another explanatory video that was done by uh, Mr. Rambali as of this morning. Um, I think we've sent it to the production team, so maybe they could um they could upload that right. And Wait, then while we are, while we are while we starting reading, the discussion, yeah. um, so we Josh, have that. The, can we can we pull up the release from June fourth? Um, I want to read it out for the public because so before well before we do that let's get the context yeah we can and then get you the understand yeah. why the why that release has come out so the context is is a very simple one and this issue with the attorney general it's actually very factually um, simple mm -hmm. but a very serious thing yeah Mr Reginald Amor senior counsel has been an attorney at law you have junior counsel you have senior counsel as you know. Junior counsel is that is is all lawyers and then when you become awarded silk or you become um, a certain a, a stage in the profession, you're awarded silk by the government, you become senior counsel and you're given much more respect. There's an increase in your, the level of fees that you can charge. Mm -hmm. You have more privileges in court, etc. Um, things like that, right? So what occurred is that the government of Trinidad and Tobago is taking action against Mr. Kwai Tong, mm -hmm. former minister, UNC minister of finance, and his then girlfriend, I don't know if it's still, but his girlfriend, Ms. Renee Pei, mm -hmm. um, in the courts of America, they're taking civil in Miami. In Miami. They're, they're taking civil proceedings against them there, and it all stems from, of course, this Piaco allegation, um, mm. corruption allegation issue. Prior to taking action in America in the civil courts, there were, as everybody knows, in Trinidad and Tobago, criminal proceedings taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. Yep. And in those criminal proceedings, in the preliminary of the preliminary inquiry, which took place in the magistrate's court. What happened is that Mr. Reginald Amor would have represented, from the facts that have arrived in the public domain, Mr. Amor would have represented Ms. Pei and Mr. Kwaitong in the court. Mm -hmm. When Mr. Amor became the Attorney General, he then had to, automatically by being appointed Attorney General, the, the proceedings on behalf of the state, on behalf of the government of Trent Tobago, is done in the name of the Attorney General. Yep. So therefore, automatically, when he became appointed as Attorney General, the proceedings in the American courts would have to be done in his name yeah. as Reginald Moore Attorney General. And therefore, what you had was a strange position, or a position where someone, Mr. Kwaitong's former lawyer, or lawyer in Trinidad and Tobago in the criminal proceedings, was now actually taking action against him in the courts in America, with, on on, on a, in a case in well, a civil I, case. Because I've heard I've heard a lot of commentators saying well, it's, it's some some different cases. It's, it's similar. The facts are the same. Well, yeah, essentially, it's, it's essentially the same incident. Incident, right? yes. It's a civil case in America. It's a criminal case, here, but really, it's a case. And you see, 
Why that's important is because as all lawyers know, and the public, law, a lawyer is someone who you must trust. Mm -hmm. A lawyer is someone who, who you can confide in freely. And a lawyer is someone that you have something called legal privilege. What mm -hmm. that means is you could tell your lawyer anything and your lawyer is not supposed to go and disclose that information to anybody. There's right. a duty of confidentiality between a lawyer and his client. And a lawyer must always act in his client's best interest. And that's why you don't see lawyers suing their former clients, etc. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Mr. Moore was appointed Attorney General. The proceedings were taken um, against Mr. Kwaitong in America. Mr. Moore automatically came in. That's not so much the issue. The issue then occurs is that there is an application made in America um, raising the issue of Mr. Moore's potential conflict. By the defendants. Yeah. So by Mr. Kwaitong and Mr. his Kwaitong. attorneys. And then what takes place, again, what has come into the public domain is that Mr. Moore then goes and swears in an affidavit under pain of perjury. He, he, he swears an affidavit to basically say that at the time he represented Mr. Kwaitong and Ms. Peer in Trinidad and Tobago, he was one, a junior counsel. Two, he, all that he did was to take notes. What has emerged since then? He has only attended one or two meetings. Yes. What has emerged since then is that both in Mr. Kwaitong's affidavit and response in America and as a matter of public record through press releases, mm -hmm. etc. And I believe even the transcripts of what took place in the criminal proceedings in Trinidad have emerged. And what those things have shown is that Mr. Moore, firstly, was actually senior counsel at the time he was appearing for Mr. Kwaitong in the magistrate's court in Trinidad. Yeah. And therefore, he was not junior counsel, he was senior counsel. So the representation made on the affidavit seems to be false. The second issue is the one about note-taking. Now, every lawyer takes notes. There's nothing yeah, derogatory about nothing that, here. right? But to give the impression that you were simply a note-taker, when, when you were acting as senior counsel in a matter, is also a misrepresentation because nobody hires senior counsel to take, <laughs> notes, to take notes, first of all, and, but not to make light of it. In any event, as senior counsel, it has been shown that he made submissions, in the written and oral yeah. submissions in the matter. And there has even been, uh, I saw a news article, which has not been disputed in the public domain, where it was reported that Mr. Moore conducted cross-examination in the matter. In order to do cross-examination, Stefan. You have to properly prepare. You have, you have to, to properly prepare, but you have, yeah. to you have to speak to your client yeah. and understand fully what your client's defense and case is. Yeah. He has to give you privileged information to yeah. conduct cross-examination. And for that matter, submissions. Yeah. In my view, a especially in a matter such as, as that. complex as, as a fraud case, yeah. as right. a corruption case. And therefore, what seems to be the case, and of course, Mr. Moore has decided to remain silent, and we await, for his, we await his full response to these allegations in the public domain, and we give him the benefit of the doubt. But what seems to be the case, what seems to be the unfortunate case is that Mr. Amor has misrepresented certain facts to a court. That is what is the, that is the allegation in against him. Yeah, and that and is an allegation. The, the problem no. is, is that you have now, as Kyle said, uh, he he is seemingly misrepresenting certain information. But yeah. this is not coming from a regular individual. No, this is coming from the titular. So before and we get bar. in before we get into that part of it, we want to be fair to Mr. Amor. Mm -hmm. Let's let's see what Mr. Amor's response to those allegations or. In fact, this statement came out before the Anna Ramdas article on Sunday because yeah. I think he may or may not have gotten a whiff of what was he, coming. He, but he made a, yeah, he made another statement afterwards. He made a sub but, So let's deal with the first statement made by Mr. Amor so that everybody understands and, and can treat it fairly and come to your own decision. Let's yeah. go. Let's put it up there, Josh. So this is the, the 4th of June, 2022. And this is, as Kyle said, Kyle given the, the context and all the factual background facing the the criminal matter yeah. and the civil matter in Miami. Read, this read, is read, what this is what the attorney general. You can read stated. it quickly. Yeah. I was in. I was sworn in and received my instrument of appointment as attorney general, minister of legal affairs, of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, on the sixteenth of March, twenty twenty-two. At the date of my appointment as attorney general, there existed a pending case in the Miami Dade County Court, Eleventh Judicial Circuit Court, Florida, between the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, nominally represented by the attorney general, Bushes versus Burke Hill consultants, Steve Ferguson, Raul Gutierrez, and Brian Quaitong. The Miami case was first commenced in 2004 by attorneys Sequa Law on the instructions of the, of the then Attorney General, Mr. John Jeremy of Senior Counsel. 
the nominal name representatives of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, which was the plaintiff in the Miami case and whose names have appeared on the record from inception, has been as follows. Mr. John Jeremy S.C., Mrs. Bridget Anissa George, Mrs. Glenda Moran, a senior counsel, Mr. John Jeremy, senior counsel, Mr. Anna Ram Logan, senior counsel, Mr. Gavin Nicholas, the Honorable Faris Alwari, and lastly myself, Reginald Amor. On the 30th of March, 2022, I attended, and I think this is an important But before part. you go there, let's, let's just pause there for a second. Mm -hmm. What the Attorney General is simply saying there is that he was appointed as Attorney General. Yeah. This was a case that was existing in the United States, and different Attorney Generals have held the position. Correct. So far, so good. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't think that's the mischief, but let's get into what happens now. Yeah. And this is the important part I want people to, 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 to listen to and draw your own conclusions. Yeah. On the 30th of March, 2022, I attended my introductory first virtual meeting by teleconference with CEQA Law with reference to the Miami case, the purpose of which was to provide me with a brief status report on the Republic of Toronto and Tobago's readiness for trial. On that call were two representatives of CEQA Law, myself and at my request, Mr. Neil Ramkrisun, the Director of Civil Litigation in the Attorney General Secretariat of the Office of the Attorney General. At the very beginning of the, at the, listen to this, at the very beginning of that virtual teleconference, I immediately advised everyone present that I had previously represented the defendant, Brian Quaitong, and his girlfriend, Ms. Renee Peer, in matters involving charges brought against them by the police involving the construction of the Den Piaco. By the Den Piaco um, thing. So, now, let me see. We go and we, and we move forward. From that moment, I was walled off by sequel law from any aspect of the case other than case management duties. That is to say, logistics of trial, naming a person to attend mediation and to attend the trial, and payment of invoices, as well as with regard to Burke settlement, in respect of which I had signed a settlement document prepared by others in my capacity as Chief Legal Officer of Trinidad Tobago. As a consequence of my stated disclosure, I did not participate in any trial-related disputes of any kind and delegated the continued case preparation to former Attorney General, the Honorable Mr. Faris Alwari and Ms. Ramkisun. Yeah. So, we can take it from there, Kyle, I think we can take it there. So, essentially what, you can come back to us, Josh. So, essentially what the Attorney General is saying here, and we want to, we want to give him his full defense, what he's saying here is that when he had the first meeting, he, uh, he, he disclosed it to the lawyers and he was walled off so to speak, right? Now, <coughs> that's not good enough because what then emerged... We have affidavit? I don't no, think okay, we have so, affidavit. So what then emerged is that there is an affidavit that was sworn by the Attorney General which essentially said that he played a junior role... A minor in the role. Yeah. A minor role in the proceedings. And that has come to be proven... Um, well, I don't want to say proven. That has come to, to be shown... Um, to cast some serious doubt on that representation, but to what, put it that way. But whatever, whatever issue with Kyle, and it's one of the, the last lines in, that I read there, mm -hmm. is that he sought, so this is our, this is the head of our bar association, this yeah. is the head of the, the um, you remember as we keep saying on this, con in this, um, on this show, there are only two people needed to form the cabinet of Trinidad Tobago, you know, the attorney general and the prime minister. Yep. And this is one of the most important figures in Trinidad and Tobago, the attorney general of Trinidad and Tobago. This is the titular head of our bar association. This is what he says in his statement. He says, I wish the advice of CEQA law in respect of any conflict of interest in my participation in Miami case. From that moment, he was walled off from C by, by CEQA law. Yeah. That tells me that he went in there, he knowing that he had that, 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 um, mm -hmm. that previous representation of Mr. Kwaitong. And he's seeking, he is now seeking the advice of the other, of a law firm yeah. on whether or not there is a, a possible conflict of interest. No, yeah, as a lawyer, you should as know. As a lawyer, you should know. And that is, that is quite worrying to me. Yeah. Because as a, as a attorney general, you should know that. I want to read, because I have the affidavit on my phone, and I want to read the affidavit, which is at the center of this allegation, as to what Mr. Amor said on the affidavit. And this is important. At paragraph 3 of the affidavit, right, this is what is said. One second, yes. Paragraph 3 of the affidavit. This is what it said. For what I recall as being a few years at the start of the preliminary inquiry, next referred to, I worked as a junior lawyer to a leading senior counsel lawyer, Alan Alexander SC, now deceased, at the time of representing defendant Brian Quaitong and his girlfriend Renee Pay 
in the preliminary inquiry in criminal proceedings in the Port of Spain Magistrate Court of the RTT concerning the criminal case brought against him for his alleged role in the planning, construction, and maintenance of the Piaco International Airport preliminary inquiry. My role as a junior lawyer was limited to minimal legal research and taking notes in the early years of the preliminary inquiry to assist my leader, Mr. Alexander S.C. And of course, what you had happened subsequent to that is Mr. Kwaitong producing evidence or giving evidence to say that simply was not true. Yeah. Right? And it has come out also in the public domain that Mr. Amor was actually senior counsel at the time he appeared. And therefore, what seems to be the case is that that was a misrepresentation on an affidavit to an American court. And what's, what's concerning to me, and I say it very clearly, what's concerning to me is one thing. I mean, I have forgotten details about what I have done on cases that I did long ago. Mm -hmm. But I could tell you if I was acting for Brian Kwaitong in the Piaco <laughs> International <laughs> Airport corruption case, yeah. which is one of the biggest and most prominent cases in our country, I probably would not forget what I did in that case. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe we're just small fishes on a big pond. Maybe, we yeah, maybe every week you have a big, a big case. Case. We don't case. I don't know. know. But, you know, and the point is, it seems to me, quite frankly, my opinion, unlikely that someone would have forgotten their role. Agreed. And therefore, I really do have a difficulty But what is taking place. I also have a difficulty. I don't know if the video has been loaded now by Mr. Rambali. Not yet. All right. So what we'll do, what I have a difficulty with is that the law association... You know, we, we are all members of the Law Association, FM, mm -hmm. but the Executive and the Council of the Law Association are really not taking this issue seriously. I mean, more than a week has passed since this allegation has broken. People are losing confidence in the profession of law. They, they're wondering if this is what lawyers do they, because the Attorney General is the head of the lawyer, the, he, the titular head of the bar. is the representative head of the bar of lawyers in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. This is our leader. Yeah. And no, it seems this is what he's accused of. <laughs> It seems, it, it seems, I, I'm just, um, I just, I, I get notifications on my phone all the time from, um, mm. from. Well, it seems that the law, <laughs> that there's a motion that's different to what the, the law association, from the, from what the, the law, law association is. is different. Well, the law association is run by an executive. The Correct. executive could take a decision to make statements. Correct. Yeah. The, it seems as though there are a group of lawyers who are moving a motion to summon a meeting, but that's different from, from the, the executive and the president thing. of the law association making a statement on this issue and considering it. And more than enough time has passed. Why can't you summon a, why can't you have an emergency meeting to discuss this issue? I really don't know. So what we'll do is um let's take a short break. Let's yeah. take a short break. And we'll come back and we'll look for that video and see if we could play that for you. Good day, sir. I came to report an incident that took place at my home in Chagones. Can I make that report here, or do I need to go to the station close to where I live? Yes, sir. Of course you can report it here. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has a one door policy. This ensures that all reports, when made to stations, whether they concern the particular station or not, will be recorded and passed on to the appropriate station where necessary. Our warned door policy also ensures that members of the public, when making reports, are treated with dignity and respect. It also ensures prompt action taken where necessary. A message from the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. I am Shervani Sukhai inviting you to be a part of my television sensation Bollywood's Best on TNT's Best TV Jaggerty. Tune in every Sunday morning from 10 to 11 as together we count down the top 10 biggest and best Bollywood videos of the week, check out the latest movie previews and of course what's trending with your favorite Bollywood celebrities.
It's the only of its kind on national television, so don't miss it. Bollywood's best every Sunday morning from 10 to 11, exclusive to TV Jagriti. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. No need for introduction. You all know who we are. So let's get down to business. I came to tell you all thanks, eh? For not informing on me when you see me shooting behind your brother in the middle of the road. Nah. Or when you see me put the drugs in the hole, right in the wall around the corner. Or when I break in your neighbor house and empty it out. And I know you didn't tell the police while well, hide the gun that I know you see. But no need to complain, because that is not your business, eh? So when I come to rob you tomorrow, with the same gun I know you see me hide, don't sell me out, eh? Thanks again. <laughs> Yoga is the world's most ancient form of physical exercise and has originated in ancient India in the Himalayas. It has been taught to us by Bhagwan Shankar, Bhagwan Shiva, who is Adi Yogi, the first yogi. Its practitioners have experienced its physical benefits, mental benefits, emotional benefits, and of course, spiritual benefits for millennia. Join me, Pandit Vivek Maharaj, on this yogic journey, Yoga Vadadan, the gift of yoga. Right here on TV Jagriti, on Mondays from 7.30 a.m. to 8 a.m., Wednesdays and Fridays from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Namaste. <laughs> Welcome back to section, section one. one yeah. Right, so, so what we could do is probably open the line six six three two three three five. Yeah. Let's open um, let's, the line. Let's open the lines, Josh. If anybody has any calls, I'll, I I saw there was some um some comments on on Facebook. I think we will actually Kyle, we could we could answer this question quickly. Mm. Um, so uh, Miss Rampasad asks, what are the constitutional and other implications of Faris Awari being appointed to replace Mr. Amor in the proceedings? So, Mr. Faris, I'll so oh, you mean, yes, yeah. yes. So, so subsequent. So they, they, well, they, were, they were a bit confused. Well, I'm that's, guessing a, Mr. that's a question they'll have to answer whether it could be done because Mr. Yeah. Rawi is not the Attorney General. And the Constitution says that it is, must be the Attorney General who brings um, matters on behalf of the state and represents the state in legal proceedings. There's also the State Liability Act. Yep. And therefore, there's, there's going to be a serious question as to whether or not Mr. Al Rawi, who has a certain portfolio to, um, I saw him, Doing an excellent job um, trimming some vines on a, on a pole or something yeah, like that. Yeah, he looked good doing it. He looked good, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. well done, well done to him. Um, attacking his new job with some gusto. I think yeah. I saw one commentator say. But, um, but, but you know, uh, whether or not he can fulfill the, the constitutional rule of an attorney general not being appointed in that position and certainly not being gazetted in that position because the gazette will normally Correct. define the roles and responsibilities of each person. Yeah. 
the Gazette, of course, has to follow what the Constitution says. All it right. can't do something on its own. So yes. I am sure if I was a lawyer, I would be challenging that in America as to whether yeah. Okay, so the minister, the minister of local government representing the, yeah. um, the state of Toronto Tobago is... It's not ideal. It's well, certainly it's on, not ideal. Well, I've never heard about it before. Yeah, yeah. So the lines are open. Um, 663-2335. 663-2335. And, and, you know, uh, uh, and essentially what is at the heart of this issue, uh, I think that everybody should understand. You had an attorney general who is responsible for maintaining the rule of law he is the titular head of the bar, the head of the legal profession. He's also the attorney general of the country. Majority. And therefore, any representations he makes to a court must be genuine, authentic, Majority. and must be done in, yeah. in, in good faith and good form. It is clear what has happened here is that the attorney general, it seems to me, has made representations which are at any in least inaccurate. Mm -hmm. At its highest was a deliberate misrepresentation. At its lowest, it seems to be that it was inaccurate. And how are we going to repair this? How are we going to repair our image? In my view, it may be the Attorney General would have to think about stepping down. And certainly the Law Association has to get involved. And I think we have a video by Mr. Rambali, which talks about that Law Association issue. Let's, let's get to that video. Um, the Law Association comprises the President, you have a vice president, you have a treasurer, you have a secretary, you have senior ordinary members and you have junior ordinary members. If the, the, the president and the vice president happen to have a position, I do not see why that quorum cannot be formed by the association to at the very least issue a public release as to what the association's position is. Without any notion or, or issue of conflict even on the president and vice president's part, they are still in a position to actually say, let us call a meeting, send out a release to the membership to say, okay, we are soliciting your views. Nothing like that has been done. So it cannot be a defense that the president and the vice president are somehow conflicted and therefore they are unable to speak on this issue. If that is the defense of the executive of the law association, and don't get me wrong, I'm not attacking them. But if that is their defense, they are like AG Amor, step down move aside, let the association run properly according to the mandate, not according to the Danish family, not according to Dr. Tim Gopisik, not according to the UNC, according to the legal professional. So their actions are insufficient. It's very lethargic, you know, and that is why I use the term very carefully. It is very concerning to see what the law association is not doing. All right? And that, that I think, puts it, puts it in a nice perspective. Mm -hmm. The law association is sleeping. You're sleeping at the wheel. The profession, the image of the legal profession is going to hell in a handbasket. The, the administration of justice is affected. The confidence in the legal system is being affected. It's been a week of silence. Proceedings on behalf of the state yeah. as a litigant has been affected. The rule of law is being affected by what is happening. The public is looking on. Lawyers and the society want some type of leadership from the law association. We're not getting it. Yes, let's, we have a call. Let's go ahead. Hi, welcome to section one. I think we lost that call. Yes, we did. Yeah. All right, we'll keep going. Yeah, so as I said, this is a very serious issue. The law association needs to take uh, action. I think that the newspaper is reporting that a motion is being circulated by members. That is in the executive. Again, that is the wider membership. And, and lawyers will have to decide whether they signed it. We have a call. Go on. Welcome to section one. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And sit around to you all. Sit around. Sit around. Right. This is section one, right? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. I want to share my view. I am a Bush lawyer. Right. And I am... Like Farris. Parallel. Yes. 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 <laughs> he, he's a... a well, he's a Bush and he's a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. No. <laughs> I am seeing some similarities with this fiasco and one with Lucy Nelson, who was a, basically gave a legal opinion to prosecute a Malcolm Jones issue, mm. and then he switched and gave a, another legal opinion to pull back the case. Your memory is very good, caller. Your memory is very yeah, good. Yeah, that's what I tell you, that Bush lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Now, listen to this. The first one with Lucy Nelson, 
the main objective is to pull the case. This strategy, I believe, is not a pull the case, but a damage the case to give you the same outcome. Mm. Yeah, all you have to remember, my memory good, you know. Yeah, those yeah. fellas. Well, we had to watch. We had to watch some of those comments. We can't make those kind of allegations <laughs> directly. No, no, no. Right? I am saying as a Bush lawyer. Yeah, you saying that yeah. this, this is your view from what you're seeing, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, and so. I am saying there is something more, something more, more in the more motor. Anymore. Yeah, I understand. You remember right. these fellas from the incarnation and the genesis were PNM people. Yeah. And the Brotherhood of Wrongdoers and the Cosa Nostra. 25 years later. I see that you're following, your, you're following your UNC. I see caller that you're listening to the UNC meetings, the Cosa yeah. Nostra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you understand what I'm saying? I understand. Yeah, I understand. But we have to be... Relationship again. Understood. We have to be careful. The, right, right. Yeah, we yeah, careful. I ain't calling no names, you know. Agreed. I, agree. well, I only call one name, Q.C. Yeah, Nelson, yeah. and that is in the public domain. Fair enough. Fair Everybody enough. know exactly what it is. So what that I'm, I am saying, it could possibly be that. Yeah. yeah. Birds of a feather fly together. Okay. All right, caller. Thanks a lot for your comments. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I can't blame the caller. He's drawing parallels. Um, At the end of the day, is, we have a freedom of speech. We have freedom we have of speech, and he's, he's he's he is free to connect the dots as he sees fit in coming to his opinion. Right. Yeah. Um, any other caller? All right. Well, yeah. I think we may have to wrap it up yeah, there. Let's it's, wrap it up there. Six. Yeah. Um, so we thanks for joining us here at section one. We have a we have we, we apologize for missing a couple of weeks as we said we was in the well, we hope we made we, we hope we made this um, these issues a little clearer. We'll definitely be picking it up because we'll see what will be happening over the next week. I'm sure these issues this issue with the attorney general probably won't go away. It might even heat up this week. Yeah. So um, we'll be back next week and um, we'll see you then. We will see you then. See you.